Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm just starting this webinar here as some of you are still arriving to join us here tonight on this Wednesday between snowstorms. And we are very happy to cozy up at home tonight with you all on this online conversation for conservation as Dr. Barry McFarlane introduces us to the Bird Atlas, Canoeing the Wilderness in Northern Ontario. But before our special guest treats us to some nice warming photos from her last uh, summer's canoe trip, I would like to acknowledge the people who have lived on these lands on which we stand and sit tonight and who still live here. The Rare Charitable Research Reserve stewards over 1,200 acres of land, but we are not the first to do so. Most of the land currently in our care is located within the Haldeman Tract which spans six miles on either side of the Grand River and is the territory of the Onkrihone people of the Six Nations of the Grand River. It is also territory of the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And in addition, we steward land at the border of the Upper Canada Treaty No. 3 in 2019 from 1818, which is also territory of the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We honor and respect the sovereignty of these First Nations and their ancestors. The lands we steward are home to many other First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who have moved to the area from across Turtle Island. As a settler founded and led organization, we make this land acknowledgement and admission of the cultural and historical harm inflicted by settlers on Indigenous peoples that has led to generational trauma and systemic injustices that persist to this day, including the dispossession of land. We acknowledge that the land we live on, work on and derive benefit from were taken away from the original stewards and is our goal to restore that connection and to work towards building ethical reciprocal relationships with the local First Nations of the lands where they are situated. Thank you. And we continue to commit to learning about and acting on our responsibilities as settlers of these lands and unlearning our cultural and historical biases that contributed to making these systemic injustices possible in what we now call Canada. Welcome again tonight to the second conversation for conservation of 2023. Before we really dive into our topic tonight, I want to alert you to a couple of things. If you really enjoy this event, I just wanted to let you know that we are currently running our first ever 50-50 raffle to raise funds for our research, education, and conservation programs. And there's still time to make an, a contribution because the draw is not until Friday at 3 p.m. So right now, the total pot has passed the $2,500 mark. Um, whoever the winner will be, they can take home half. So this is getting quite lucrative. And there's still lots of time to purchase tickets. You can visit um, rafflebox.ca slash raffle slash rare. And every ticket purchased, of course, increases the jackpot and increases your chances to win and also increases the funds raised to protect our natural spaces here at rare. So it's truly a win-win situation for everyone. And if you're over 18 and a resident of Ontario, please go check it out and buy some tickets. And if gambling is not really your thing and you'd rather make a straight up donation, you can do so as well if you click the donate button on our website. But now I have the absolute utmost pleasure to welcome back Dr. Vary McFarlane to tell us more about birds and canoes. So Vary McFarlane is the Director of Science and Stewardship of the Ontario Region at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Dr. McFarlane was born in the United Kingdom, where she received her undergraduate degree in ecology from the University of Stirling in Scotland, and her doctorate in behavioral ecology from the University of Exeter in Cornwall, England. She has worked as a conservation biologist for the Nature Conservancy of Canada since 2008, including coordinating field-scale restoration of various habitats throughout southwestern Ontario. In addition, Vari is also an avid camper who visits remote locations by canoe as part of her research work. And last year, we were very privileged to have Vari join us to talk about one such trip, researching bird breeding pairs along the waterways of Northern Ontario. And this year, she's back to talk about the bird atlas, along with stories of her most recent trip along the Mukitai River, where it joins the Atapiskat around about 53 degrees north which is quite far north. So welcome back, Vari, and the floor is now yours. We very much look forward to your newest and latest stories and photographs. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, um, thank you so much for having me back. Um, it's a real privilege to be here um, talking about similar but different from, from what some of you may have heard last year. Um, this is a slightly different adventure with a bit more focus on the, the bird data collection. Um, so yeah, as, as you've already heard, we, we were lucky to spend some time on the Mukatai River um, in Northern Ontario. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where that is and how we got there and all the fun adventures that we, we engaged with when we were there. Um, first of all, I'm just gonna give you a little bit more of an introduction, a bit more of a sort of context to me as to, to how, how I ended up doing these, these um, silly Northern adventures. Um, but hopefully to make it seem a little bit more accessible to, to hopefully many of you who might be interested in, in trying some of this out yourself. Um, as you've heard, I grew up in Scotland. Um, I spent some time in South Africa doing a PhD on birds and my, my interest in birds was, was definitely kindled from a, a very young age and continued into to turning into a research project. Um, and I then moved to London, Ontario um, in 2006. Um, and as you've heard, I'm, I work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So, so I am a, a professional conservation biologist, effectively. But um, I think my point here is that you don't actually have to be one of them to do some of the things that I'm going to share with you this evening. Um, we only started canoeing in July 2020. So it was a, a, a pandemic hobby that, that we took up, like many other people in Ontario, it turns out. Um, so we're very, very new to this whole aquatic business. Um, uh, but this last summer, we we managed to pull off a, a 12 day um, backcountry in Northern Ontario atlasing trip, as Stephanie said, at 53 degrees north, which in Ontario terms is, is pretty far, far north. And I will show you just how far shortly. Um, so yeah, so you might well be like, how on earth did you do that? Like, why did you do something that crazy that early on in your canoeing career? But it is on the back of quite a lot more experience of spending time in, in the outdoors. Um, and we, we packed in a fair amount of fairly remote canoe tripping before this last summer as well. Um, so in 2020, our first year, we, we did quite a few days in, in Algonquin, like, like many of you, I'm sure. Um, but then we also went a little further afield up to Quetico Provincial Park in northwestern Ontario. And then last year, those of you that attended my talk um, with Rare, we did an 18 day trip in Wabakimi Provincial Park, also in, in northwestern Ontario. Um, but also we, we've done a lot of international backcountry wilderness mountain stuff. So it's all been very terrestrial up until very recently, but we, we don't just suddenly get off our couch and pop into the wilderness. We do have slightly more experience than it might sound having just started canoeing so recently. On top of that, we, um, we've, we've got about seven days of whitewater instruction in a canoe. So we um, did a five day intensive tandem canoe whitewater course. Um, we've got wilderness first aid and all of these things. So um, all of these things are, I'm just trying to kind of set the scene for it, it being relatively accessible. These are all things that, that um, based here in Ontario, it, it is actually a great part of the world to pick up a lot of these skill, skill sets that can allow you to, to get to some of these really exciting places, but quite safely and comfortably. So um, where is this place? So the Mukatai River, I had also never heard of it um, before it showed up on a list of possible bird atlasing destinations. Uh, this is approximately where it is in Northern Ontario. So if you look at a map of Ontario and probably zoom out a little bit to make sure you can see the, the very top of Ontario, um, then go to this island and then go west. And then that's more or less where the, the Mukatai River is. Um, it's at about 53 degrees north. Um, I'm based in London, and just for reference, Toronto is about 43 degrees north. So it's a full, full 10 degrees further north than, than what we call Southern Ontario. Um, the lands in this area are um, tree lands. They're part of the James Bay Treaty 9. Um, and this is, you can, you can Google um, this and learn a little bit more about it. I would encourage you to do so. Um, but essentially it's an agreement between um, the Ojibwe, Cree and several other Indigenous nations um, and the Crown. And it was a huge privilege um, as a visitor to Canada. I, as I mentioned, I grew up in Scotland. Um, I still have a lot to learn about um, local Indigenous cultures um, and their stewardship of these lands. So it was an incredible privilege to be able to visit those lands, um, spend time there um, and collect some data that are, are hopefully of, of help to, to working out how to, to continue to steward these incredible places. Um, we, it was still um, COVID o'clock, of course, so we we weren't we didn't have the opportunity to visit any local communities. Unfortunately, we definitely wanted to to keep 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 away and and um, 
leave people in peace and also where we actually were was a fair distance away from any actual communities at that point in the year. Uh, but I'm really hoping in future trips we might be able to meet with people and learn a little bit more directly about how how these lands are are, are integrated with the, these incredible cultures. So a little bit more about our journey. Um, Muktide River, as I said, is a fair ways away from, from London. So it was a two day drive up to Nakina, um, followed by a two hour float plane flight to the Mukhtai River. Um, so it was, it was a fair adventure even just to get there and it allowed us to see some really beautiful places in Ontario, albeit um, without getting to stop and, and look at them because time was short. Um, we then, of course, had to do a weigh-in, so I, I am not terribly experienced with interacting with float planes, but you have to weigh all of your things so that we know, you know, quite literally how much fuel to stick in the plane and how far the pilot can actually go after he drops us off. Um, so this is the majority of our gear, um, a bunch of, you know, all of our camping gear, a bunch of camera gear um, and so forth, all kind of piled onto this weigh scale. Um, and then all had to fit into this little float plane. Um, we had, uh, we had, it was a group of four and we had two canoes and each of the canoes were actually strapped to the outside of the floats of this plane, um, which you actually can't see in this photo. Um, and this is our team all geared up. This is our last tiny little bit of um, um, sort of Southern Northern Ontario mosquitoes and black flies before escaping even further North to, to feed more of the wildlife slightly further North. Um, you can see we're already geared up to, to try to protect ourselves a little bit and save some of our blood for ourselves. Um, if you've not been on a float plane before, it's certainly an interesting experience. All of, You're in there right with all of your gear. It's super, super loud, so it's actually really worth bringing some earplugs, especially if the flight is you know a couple of hours like ours was. Um, it is, is a pretty loud experience, but a really spectacular one as well. Um, and then you get kind of, this is us being dropped off in the river with its very muddy, scrubby banks. And suddenly that was us kind of having to unload and that was us for the next almost couple of weeks. Um, however, the view flying into this area was truly incredible. Um, we're, we're right at the, the southern edge of what's known as the Hudson Bay Lowlands. And this is essentially the largest wetlands in Canada. Um, and yet it actually represents about 25% of Ontario's land mass um, by area, which is really an interesting perspective that you, you're probably like me, so used to looking at a map of Ontario and it's basically kind of southern Ontario, maybe up to Sault Ste. Marie, maybe, maybe kind of a little bit further. Um, but there's a heck of a lot more very, very soggy wetland well beyond that that we, we often tend not to think terribly much about. Um, so just a quick little um, video, hopefully this works okay here. Um, this is, um, we got unloaded and our canoes are very messily loaded as you can see for now, because it was a little bit chaotic kind of discouraging ourselves from the, the plane. Um, and then we got to watch the, the plane take off. Um, hopefully it will work. Um, Yeah, so that was that was us. Um, it was quite a deafening silence once the plane actually left and the, the realization that this was us, just a group of four of us with um, a whole bunch of birds that were already starting to hear, um, quite a lot of fairly hungry insects that were already starting to be quite excited about us showing up. Um, so it was a very kind of sobering moment when you realize that, you know, this is it, this is real, this is actually you being dumped in the wilderness. Um, oops. Um, so just a little bit of a, a map, it doesn't show up super well, but um, this is the Mukatai River here. It's, it's a very this thin little, little string of a river up here, and here it flows almost parallel to this much larger river, which is the Atawapiskat River. Now the At Atawapiskat River continues out to the east um, and pours into the sea um, quite a few days paddled beyond where our final pickup point was here. Um, so we started off just up here at the West End, so this is our, our first campsite. Um, and we had a bunch of data collection that will go into all the way along this river until the, the Mukatai ends in a confluence with the Atawapiskat. So we had a little stretch of the Atawapiskat that we got to paddle as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is our very first campsite. It doesn't look like much. It kind of wasn't much. Um, but we spent, I think, two or maybe three nights here. Um, it was a lot more comfortable than it actually looked. This is a slight close-up. Um, so we knew that 
the the river kind of abuts the the land at a point where it's very often very very scrubby but in this area there were some quite nice big tall trees and enough space that we could actually make a little space to, to put our tanks um so we did actually bring and for any of you that are interested in doing this kind of trip, I'm going to have some little gear tips and tricks as I go through here. Um, these were probably our favourite toys of the whole trip. Um, one is a pair of grotty old work gloves with the, the finger and thumb cut off so you can still use a pencil and write in a notebook. Um, and the other thing is these, these clippers or secateurs. Um, now, obviously, wherever we go, we, we really want to minimise our footprint and minimise any kind of damage we do to any vegetation and wildlife and so forth. But we also have to be reasonable. We have to find a place to put our tent up. Um, so having these was actually fantastic. It was actually exactly the right tool for this kind of vegetation community. It wasn't like big branches that you maybe needed a saw or a or an axe to, to cut through. It was actually lots of little twiggy things, um, including some really not very friendly wild roses. So secateurs were a must have in, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, so now I'm gonna introduce the, the breeding bird atlas, what this thing actually is. I keep referencing it, but it's probably time to actually say what it is. Um, so the goal of the atlas is to essentially map the distribution and abundance of all approximately 300 breeding bird species in Ontario. Um, and this is a it's a once in every 20 year data collection effort and the data collection itself takes a five year period. <clears throat> so every 20 years, it's basically a checkup of, of how our, our breeding birds in Ontario are doing. Um, the entire province is divided into an approximately 10 by 10 kilometer uh, into 10 by 10 kilometer grids or squares um, and volunteers collect data on a square by square basis. Um, so. You can contribute to the Breeding Bird Atlas anywhere in Ontario at any time you like. If you see a, a bird carrying a stick, which you might right now, bald eagles are, are nest building and actually starting to incubate right now, then that's actually really important data. Um, and you can look up the website and, and work out how you contribute that data to this ever increasing data set. Um, the Atlas is a partnership project of, of several organizations that you can see, see their logos here. Um, I'm just a volunteer, so I don't actually represent the Atlas, but um, I've come to know it reasonably well over the last few years as a volunteer contributor. Um, and as a volunteer, um, I'm also very grateful that the Atlas is funded by many incredibly generous um, um, funders. Um, and there's also several, um, several organizations that are supporting in kind with, with in kind support. Now, a key example, you'll probably notice Ontario Parks' logo up there. Um, I understand that if you're um, wanting to volunteer for the Atlas and are interested in doing so from a provincial park, then sometimes there's some opportunities for you to um, get into those parks, perhaps at a reduced rate, or at least get in um, to areas that you might not otherwise get to visit as a regular um, visitor. So there's some great benefits in it as, as a volunteer. So um, the plane has left, our canoes are loaded, we found and packed out our first campsite. So it's time to start collecting data. So across the Mukatai River, we had three priority squares to focus our efforts. So that's these 10 by 10 kilometer squares. And we had to spend as much time as we could in each of those three squares, collecting as much data as possible. Now, the main thing that we were doing was using our ears, um, li listening for birds basically the whole time. Um, even when we're asleep, it's possible to get woken up by owls calling. Not if you're me, because I think I repel owls. But our colleagues did hear, um, our friends that were with us did actually hear um, some owls overnight as well. So there really is no rest for the, the breeding bird atlaser. Um, so we're hoping to see breeding evidence. Um, so that includes things like, as I mentioned or, already, birds carrying nesting material or perhaps carrying food, um, delivering food to their young in their nest. Um, so some photos, these are photos that I took in um, a square that I volunteer for down here near London. So on the left, the, the barn swall on the left has a beak full of mud and that bird is actually using that to, to build its nice little nest. Um, and then next door, the American robin had a beak full of nice tasty worms that it was presumably taking to one of its chicks. So these are the kind of things that we would love to see. Um, but there is a reason that these are nice pretty pictures that I took from Southern Ontario. Because quite a lot of um, northern Ontario, where we were working, looks a bit more like this. Um, so it's very, very difficult to see really very much of anything for quite a lot of the time. And especially if you're actually having to look at your feet and clamber through this kind of, kind of mess. Um, or sometimes it looks like this as you're trying to find your point count location. Um, so suffice to say that 
using your ears is actually a very important skill set. And there's all sorts of tips and tricks and cool resources on the Breeding Bird Atlas website to help you build those skills or test your skills if you're, you're already partway there. Um, so although we, we, we know that we often can't see quite as much breeding evidence as we might prefer in Northern Ontario, then a singing bird in June in the boreal habitat is very likely to be breeding there. Um, so that's kind of the next best thing that we have. So the way that we gather information about that is through what we call point counts. And these are these little red blobs all over this map here are predetermined point count locations. Um, the idea is that you go to these points and you spend five minutes documenting every single species and every single individual of each species that you hear and also anything that you see with your eyes, should you be lucky enough to see anything. Um, and you can do these point counts from about 30 minutes before sunrise up until about five hours after sunrise. Um, and as I mentioned, they're at these predetermined locations. So this is our very last priority square on the Mukatai trip. This is the Mukatai River coming in here up in the top left corner of the photo. And this big river is the Atawapiskat River. And this little campsite symbol, this is where we, we camped. And all of these red blobs are predetermined point count locations that the four of us had to get to in order to do these um, survey, these five minute surveys. Um, and if you're familiar with looking at aerial imagery like this, then you'll already be thinking what we were thinking during our planning is that that looks like a lot of water to have to navigate around. So first thing in the morning, we get up super early. I'll talk about that in a second um, and paddle across and then hike um, through these incredibly boggy bits of terrain like we saw from the aerial photo I took from the aeroplane and then spend five minutes at each of these locations listening for birds. Um, so. You'll remember I mentioned it was at 53 degrees north, which does mean that sunrise is shortly after 4 a.m., which in my books is quite early. Um, so we would get up at um, kind of 4, 4.15, 4 um, roll out of our tents, jam some food into us very quickly, a cliff bar or something like that, um, often jump in the canoe and paddle across to where we would then have to start hiking out to these predetermined locations. Uh, which was really hard work. We became very sleep deprived very, very quickly. But the reward was that we got to see incredible sunrises like this in this ridiculously spectacular habitat in, in the Hudson Bay Lowlands, um, which was just a real, real pleasure. Um, I will talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but one of the things that wasn't quite so much of a pleasure, you can probably see the large cloud of mosquitoes buzzing around my head here as, a, as I'm trying to listen to birdsong. Um, occasionally, it was actually quite challenging to make sure I was hearing every single bird because of the clamoring of mosquitoes in my ears. But, um, you yeah, know, that's just part of the fun, right? Um, the other aspect of the data collection efforts is um, the, the, the technology that we're able to use this time around. Um, there's a lot more technology behind the Breeding Bird Atlas than there have been in previous data collection efforts, of course. Um, time passes and technology advances and becomes smaller and easier to carry into these cold places. And that's really revolutionized how we can collect data to better understand population trends and distribution of, of birds and indeed other wildlife. Um, so this little device here is called the Zoom recording device. Um, so each time I did a point count, I was there using my ears and using my eyes, but this little device was also recording the same things I was hearing, um, which which essentially means that, that some poor volunteer has presumably spent last winter working out just how good or bad or otherwise I actually am at listening for birds with just my ears. Um, but this does provide a backup and it provides another way of collecting data. But also um, for the purposes of, of discussion tonight, um, this also makes doing point counts very accessible to anybody. Um, many of our birds um, sing in a very high-pitched manner, and as, as we all age, it becomes more and more difficult for us to hear some of those songs and calls. Whereas these Zoom devices, they, they don't apparently age, and they don't have failing ears like many, many of us do. So this means that any of us can actually grab a Zoom device and stick it on a tree and, and document those point counts, even if we're not um, either able to hear all of the bird song or if we're not super confident with our, our identification skills either. Um, so yeah, this is just a close-up of the Zoom device. Um, we can, you have to keep a fairly clear head about you while you're doing these um, data collection efforts, recording obvious things like the date, the time, the location, who it is that's doing the, the observations. 
Um, we also took photos of the immediate habitat. So we take photos to show the vegetation community that, that, that we're collecting data from because plant, um, plant structure and, and even plant species can be quite important in what, what bird species you end up seeing in that immediate area. Um, and also we would, um, so we'd have the recording device going, recording things, but then I would also be documenting the species that I heard on an app on my cell phone as I went. So lots of tech to juggle in the wilderness, which, which can be lots of fun. Um, so cumulatively, all of these things means it does get quite exhausting. So um, this is what Brent was tending to do while I was doing my point counts. Um, he was taking a very well-deserved break on this wonderful mat of, of moss and lichen and so forth. Um, after having worked out our route around all of the box to get to our next point count location. Um, and actually, this is a good opportunity to, to mention just briefly some of the gear that we, we found worked quite well for us. So on, you'll notice that all the photos of, of humans were always wearing these bug jackets. And these are awesome. Um, they're fairly um, firm or fairly robust canvas, which is actually really great for the times when you have to push through vegetation to get to your next point count. It really doesn't rip very easily. Um, but it's meshy enough that you can kind of let off steam from under your arms. And it has this really cool meshy hood that you can bring up and you can still hear and see you really quite well, but um, none of your little buzzy insecty friends can come and take a nibble. Um, in terms of footwear, this is always a challenge doing this kind of work. It's basically wet all of the time. So what Brent opted to do was he wore um, some washer shoes, which have got really good drainage in them, but we would wear gaiters to kind of keep the jaggy vegetation out of our socks and stop our shins being stabbed too badly by um, sticks and things. So the other bit of tech that we had with us were these automated automatic recording units or ARUs. Um, so we had two of these with us and these essentially represented an additional two people. Um, we can deploy these in the afternoon, like once we've done our point counts in the morning, we could deploy these, just tie them to a tree and leave them overnight. Um, you can activate them using a very simple phone app, and they will actually effectively do point counts a little bit at dusk to catch some of those evening birds like, like night hawks and things and, and all of the owls that I never see. Um, but then they'll also come on first thing in the morning and do a whole series of point counts throughout that morning period while we're busy off doing other point counts elsewhere. Um, so it really increases the amount of data that we can collect in these areas that are so, so difficult to, to get to. Once again, we'd um, document the habitat um, vegetation right around these locations that we chose. Um, so moving on to what many of you might actually really be here for, which is some of the actual birdies that we got to see. Um, now, as mentioned, it didn't actually get to see very many birds when it came to it. Um, it was a very small proportion of the birds that we detected that I actually managed to clap eyes on, and an even smaller proportion of individuals that we detected that I managed to clap eyes on. Um, this is a little palm warbler that did actually pop up out of the bushes. Unfortunately, it wasn't doing anything useful like carrying a, a stick or a caterpillar, but it did sit there and have a good look at, look at me long enough for me to pull my, my camera out and, and grab a quick picture. Um, so these guys are, they'll be, you know, it's, spring is not super far away. These little guys will be coming through. They're one of our earlier migrants that come through southern Ontario. Um, but they go right the way up there and breed out in that kind of relatively open and scrubby edges of the, the, the muskeg habitat. Um, these cedar waxwings, they, they hang out around here in southern Ontario all winter, but they also extend way up into quite far north in Ontario. Um, these guys are actually courtship feeding, so you can kind of see the bird on the left has, has some a lump of probably tasty spider or beetle or something in its bill. And um, we just actually watched the bird on the right feed to it, which was actually really cool to see. Um, this was one of our, this is a beautiful evening that we had that was completely calm and still and clear. And it was a really nice opportunity for a little bit of photography. Um, as a birder, some of you might be familiar with the, this terminology, but I was excited to have two lifers on my trip. So that's two bird species I'd never seen before anywhere in the world. Um, so this is the first one. The, um, American three-toed woodpecker. We're actually incredibly lucky. We're stumbling through some really horrific terrain. Actually, the terrain I showed you in that photo quite early on, um, and I actually found the nest of these guys. The, the male on the left and the female on the right were coming back and forth repeatedly with beakfuls of food, and we could hear the little babies inside the cavity in the tree calling for, for the next meal. So that was a real privilege to see. The other new bird for me was a, was Connecticut warblers. I didn't actually get to see it, but I did hear them on several point counts. So that was quite exciting for me. Um, another bird that was fun to see was Arctic terns. I've 
seen these in breeding colonies in Scotland as I was growing up many, many times, but I'd never actually caught up with them in Ontario before. So it was really neat to see these birds actually on several occasions. Um, not quite sure exactly where they were breeding. They were doing a little bit of courtship feeding, carrying little fish around in their bills and feeding them to each other, which was really neat. But we didn't find what we thought would be a colony. So it's possible these guys were actually breeding, you know, not where we are, but kind of further out on the coastline. But real privilege to catch up with them nonetheless. Another thing that I get a real kick out of seeing is um, Bonaparte's gulls. Again, these are a, a fairly common gull that we'll see coming through our area. Actually, fairly soon they do show up relatively early on. Um, and it will fly across agricultural land even in the, the, the early spring. Um, but these guys nest up in the boreal and actually nest in trees, which is kind of cool to think of a, a gull sitting on a nest in a tree. In a tree. Even more fun is watching shorebirds in trees. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing this quite a few times now, but I still get such a kick out of seeing both in this trip, this case, um, both greater and lesser yellow legs balancing really, really awkwardly on top of these squinty little um, conifer trees up on the muskeg. It just seems like they have the wrong equipment to spending time in that habitat. But of course, that's what the, the Hudson Bay lowlands are so incredibly important for is actually providing breeding habitat for these shorebirds that some of them migrate incredibly long distances through down through the US, through Central, even into South America. Um, and they're on their way back. I think I've already heard a report of, I forget which species, maybe lesser yellow legs already um, in Southern Ontario. So they're coming and they're, they're gonna be heading back up to stand on top of conifer trees, yelling at intrepid breeding bird atlas volunteers. Um, we're super, super excited to find this little guy. This is actually this little girl. This is a least sandpiper, and she actually had a couple of little tiny fluffy chicks that she had under her wings on the ground. Um, we didn't realize she was there until suddenly she flew up and stood on this little tamarack tree. This tamarack tree was about waist high, by the way, um, and she was clearly quite distressed and eventually worked out that she had two little chicks there. So um, I grabbed a quick photo of her and, and left her in peace as, as quickly as we possibly could. But that was a really neat... Um, evidence um, evidence of that species breeding at that latitude. Um, of course, there were a few other things that weren't birds um, that one can always look at as well. So um, this is a plant I really get a kick out of seeing in, in Ontario. It's also a plant I'm very familiar with in Scotland. It's one of these kind of circumboreal boreal species. Um, this is a really windy day and I managed to grab a, a shot of it just as the, the um, the flower spike kind of stopped blowing in the wind very, very briefly. There are lots of really, really cool um, bog, northern bog kind of plants that were all around kind of peak flowering time while we were there. We didn't see too much in the way of mammals on this trip. Um, I think we saw two or maybe three moose. Um, this was a moose that was crossing the river in front of us as we were paddling downstream. Um, we did see a little family of wolves and wolf pups, but incredibly, incredibly briefly and not long enough to grab a photo, unfortunately. We were kind of being brought down the river on fairly fast current at that point in time, but it was still really, really neat to see. And um, this is actually one of the last photographs that I took on the trip. This is a Polyphemus moss, moth. Um, this thing was actually really colossal. It was, um, you know, kind of the body was kind of a good thumb length or so. Um, and of course, it's the caterpillars of animals like these that are, are sustaining many of these birds that are, are up here breeding at this time of year. Um, so it's really neat to actually see this giant adult moth right at the end of the trip. Um, so that's a little bit of kind of eye candy of some of the cool animals that we, animals and plants that we saw. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time quickly talking a little bit more about like some of the skill sets that we would recommend that you, you try to grab if you don't have already, if you're um, interested in this kind of remote trip. And even if you're not, if you're interested in doing something even locally, these are very, very useful skills to have. Um, so there were just four of us. We did have a, an emergency um, in-reach device, so we could communicate back with the, the outside world every day if we needed to, and we could get emergency help fairly quickly and promptly. Um, but nonetheless, you're still probably quite a few hours away from professional medical help. So um, it was quite comforting to have um, some level of wilderness first aid training and a little bit of experience with that. I've never really had to put any of that into action touch wood so far, unfortunately, um, but it's still comforting to know that there's a little bit of training and you have some idea of what to do um, should we end up in some kind of unpleasant situation. Um, I mentioned also um, whitewater. There wasn't actually a huge amount of whitewater on this trip. I know I haven't talked a huge amount about the canoeing side of this, 
Um, this photo is probably one of the more challenging rapids that we came across, and it really wasn't challenging at all. It was probably kind of, we're not very good at gauging class, but probably class one-ish. Um, there wasn't really a whole lot that we had to steer around, and the water levels were deep enough that we we didn't even hit too many rocks. So, um, but it was still good to have had some white water um, skill set behind us, so we could know how to navigate these things, know how to read rapids and plan a route, and know how we could kind of steer and operate the boat to get ourselves out of difficulties. Um, and there's certainly plenty of places um, we've been lucky to do some courses at both Paddler Co-op and and Madawaska Canoe Centre, and we certainly had great experiences. Um, doing those um, ourselves. And the other thing is just basic backcountry camping. Um, you can, you know, you're working out how you can get yourself comfortable with the idea of packing your life into a couple of not very big bags and flying into the remote wilderness for a bunch of time um, and being comfortable with yourself and comfortable with that concept is something that probably only comes with actually doing it and trying it out and doing it for a couple of nights at at a time and then gradually building up from there until you're really comfortable doing that. Um, but the the privilege, um, the privilege that you get from doing that is is really incredible, getting to spend time in these wonderful places. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing that kind of comes with a little bit of experience when you if you want to go somewhere as remote as this, it's worth being knowing that you're able to kind of deal with sort of unexpected situations that might arise. And again, that's really just a, a time in the wilderness or a time thinking about it kind of a thing. Um, so this was actually a, a photo of our very last campsite on the Atawapiskat River, our last, last priority square. And um, we set the camp up, the tents had all gone up really nicely. We were really pleased with how everything had gone. Like the, the big bug tarp that I'll talk about went up really nicely and everything felt really strong and taut. Um, but then you'll notice how the sky up here is kind of black and a little bit for, foreboding. Um, so the next thing that happened was our entire camp got completely flattened by a thunderstorm. <laughs> so we it didn't demolish anything quite to the extent that that photo shows. We proactively pulled everything down before the kind of swirling winds could do too, too much damage. Um, but it did break one of the poles for the, the bug trap. This is it kind of bent over at 45 degrees. Um, so suddenly we were, we were without a tent pole. Fortunately, we weren't too, too far beyond tree line. We're actually, you know, there's still plenty of trees around. So um, Brent and George had lots of fun going off and, and um, making their own tent pole to replace the one that we'd lost. But just a silly little anecdote of, of some of the things that can go wrong. This wasn't really a huge problem at all, but um, it's good to be in situations knowing that you, you can have, you can make a plan to get out of that situation and still be safe and comfortable despite things that might go wrong. And having a little bit of redundancy in the, the, the gear that you might have with you is, is good for that kind of thing as well. So don't just carry exactly the right number of tent pegs, for example, chuck in a couple of spares just to be sure that kind of thing. Um, so I've alluded to this a few times, but um, there were a few insects that were quite interested in consuming some of our blood for pretty much all of the time. Um, it varied from being, let's be honest, fairly brutal to quite brutal to actually possibly extremely brutal. Um, but despite that, yes, I'm still going back this year. Um, yes, I'll probably go back the following year. Um, there's ways to deal with it. Um, I mentioned already these bug jackets that we have, uh, which are really effective. They're, they really keep mosquitoes from, from getting in and from biting you. Um, we also have this Eureka no bug zone tent, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, this is a slightly smaller one, but even at that, you can still fit four grown-ups in here and, and cook and eat and get changed and do all of those kind of things quite comfortably. Um, so this was effectively our living room for the whole time for the four of us was, was in one of these bug tarps. Um, and it was it was super comfortable. Um, we generally um, run a mosquito coil inside there as well because the, the density of the bitey things outside was high enough that every time you'd open the door, there'd always be a few that would come back in with you. Um, but we're able to make it really quite comfortable um, and, and be able to, to go about our lives. And the other key thing that even in these horrendously buggy places, it's actually very variable. Some days were bad, some days were fine. Um, some parts of some days were really, really bad, whereas later in the day was fine. Um, so it wasn't this constant misery at all that you might expect it might be in, in these kind of latitudes. Um, just another kind of quick thing is that we we were on a data collection collecting expedition. It, it, I mean, it, it was my vacation time, but it wasn't really a vacation. 
Um, so you do need to kind of keep a clear head about collecting the data and keeping your, your data in order. So um, we had a notebook, multiple backup writing implements with us. It was always important to make sure that you knew exactly what day it was and exactly what time it was and exactly where you were and all of those kind of things. Um, and making sure that you knew where all that gear was at all times, keeping things backed up. The, the thing in the middle is a notebook that I actually wrote my data into. That notebook never left the camp. It was always in a waterproof bag inside another waterproof bag. Um, so the stuff that went out in the field, if I lost it, I wouldn't actually be losing terribly much data at time. Um, so it's, it's worth just kind of keeping a clear head about you with those things, which can be a little challenging in some of these quite difficult conditions. Um, but the rewards are that you get to spend time with these really cool plants. This is a Mysticini primrose, which is a, a good kind of northern Ontario species that you, you don't get to see terribly, terribly often. Um, I mentioned also the ARUs um, that were also operated with a phone app. So it was actually really important that we spend a lot of time proactively making sure that our various devices and things were charged. Um, so we have this little solar panel that's hanging on the tent here. So whenever the sun came out, we're always like, oh, we should get a bunch of stuff on to charge and be really proactive so we weren't caught without, without navigation, without communication, without whatever, that, those kind of things. So. Um, and kind of related to that, just a little bit more on, on gear. Those of you that attended my talk last year will have seen this slide before, but um, bits and pieces to make this fairly easy. Um, I use my smartphone a fair amount in the wilderness. It's on airplane mode and battery saver mode. There's obviously no cell phone communication in many of these places, so there's no point in wasting battery trying to find a cell phone signal. But you can still use the GPS on your phone. So this is a really helpful thing to use as a, obviously we have paper maps as well. But as a backup for navigating on that kind of fine scale, we'd use this, um, we downloaded aerial imagery into our phone so we could see, oh, there's a giant pond over there. We want to walk right around here to get to the next point can't. So we could actually use it to navigate on a very small, very fine scale like that. Um, the phone therefore becomes quite a precious thing. It, it, it is full of data, it's full of photos, it's full of um, iNaturalist observations as well. Um, so I always use this lanyard to keep it attached to me or my backpack or something so that um, it doesn't disappear too far into the swamp if I drop it. Um, and this is a, an example of a, a battery pack. We'd usually have two of these with us and we charge the battery pack from the solar panel so that we always had some extra power um, to keep things charged up for the, the data collection and navigation and so forth that we're doing. Um, and yeah, so I ended up with piles and piles of data on phone, but also backed up on paper. Um, and you can submit that information when you return to, to the land of connectivity, when you fly back out of these places. Um, so yeah, so I've already said that. So these are some tips and tricks that if any of you are, are doing any kind of wilderness or backcountry um, exploring this coming season, then you can tap into some of these things. You can I'd encourage you to, to look up the Breeding Bird Atlas, um, get familiar with eBird, get familiar with iNaturalist. These are all really powerful apps that can help, um, help you get a bit more out of some of your wilderness trips and also help you contribute to, to these really cool global data sets to help us better understand the biodiversity all around us. Um, Quick mention of our boat. I know I've not talked a whole lot about canoeing this time, the canoeing itself, but um, this is the, the boat that we have. It's an H2O Voyager. Um, it is a whitewater expedition boat. Um, it's a remarkably light boat. I find it's remarkably light if you get someone else to carry it as well. Um, that's my, my tip there. Um, but actually uh, for a whitewater boat, it is actually a, a very light boat and yet is incredibly robust. Where, as you will have picked up, we're not expert whitewater canoeists yet. Um, so we certainly hit some rocks and we certainly have bumped and ground our way down some stuff um, in previous years and really low water levels. Um, and there is the water, the boat is still very intact, very, um, um, very watertight. And we're very, very pleased with it as a, as an expedition boat. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, with all of these, um, I know this is hard work. It's, quite an uncomfortable situation in some ways, like it's, it's buggy, it's pretty remote camping, it's pretty rough, it's pretty rugged, the weather isn't always perfect, but the rewards are really incredible. Um, spending time in this kind of open habitat is, is a real privilege and 
it is incredibly beautiful, especially in days like this. It was a, it was a howling gale this day, so we couldn't actually do any data collection because you can't hear birds singing when it's really windy. But we could go out and deploy the ARUs and still kind of look for, for birds that were flying around. And it was just incredible to spend time in this kind of habitat. And on top of that, it was, it was a real pl pleasure to be able to collect data that can perhaps help inform um, how we might decide as a society and how Indigenous communities might use that information to decide how to manage the incredible natural resources in these areas. Um, where we're collecting data was just immediately east of the, the proposed Ring of Fire development area. So it was interesting to be thinking about that as we we're collecting information, as we we're thinking about some of the species that, that call this place home and can't call anywhere else home because that's what they've evolved to use. Um, so it's, it's definitely an important data collecting um, effort that it's a privilege to be able to contribute to. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, feedback, um, and definitely excited if any of you are interested in, in signing up for an Atlas trip next year. I understand there's still some spaces, perhaps even for this coming summer, but certainly there's another couple of years of data collection that we, we still have to embark on. So there's lots of opportunities for, for you to get involved if you are excited to do so. Thank you so much, Murray. That was uh, that was really interesting. Again, it's just it's so fascinating. We have a couple of questions um, in the Q and A box. If there are additional questions, it's now time uh, to enter them in the Q and A box so that we can go through them. Um, the first question is: If you don't see the birds and you're just using their calls, how do you determine the number of individuals? Oh, that is a good question. Um, the short answer is it's quite hard. <laughs> um, the longer answer is that it is possible to kind of hear, once you get to know bird song, then you can, you know how long that song is supposed to be, you know all of the different parts to that song. Um, so you can be listening out for working out roughly which direction that noise is coming from and then listening out for um, whether that song is finished or not. And then if you hear another song from over on your left, then you can probably discern that there's a different bird over there. Uh, but it does take a bunch of practice. Um, it is something that is actually quite difficult to really um, to really measure how good you have become at doing that. And partly that's what the Zoom devices will start to contribute to now that we're running the Zoom recording devices in parallel with people like me actually trying to do it live. Um, we'll probably start learning what the kind of fudge factor needs to be as to how accurate or otherwise that ends up being. Um, but it, but it's certainly tricky, but it, but it is doable to see kind of where, where things are coming from. You can you can even start thinking about practicing that in a room with people, like like how can you discern where how many people are in that room or whether that person's speaking from this corner or that corner. It's kind of a similar idea there. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. The next couple of questions are more around uh, technology. I think you have basically partially answered them already, but people were interested if you had some satellite phone or radio or other means of emergency contact and uh, are also wondering what you use for batteries or chargers to keep items powered. Yeah, good question. So we... Um... So we have um, what, what are called battery packs, so two biggish battery packs. Now each of them can charge our cell phones, I think about five or six times. So each battery contains like five or six cell phones worth of power. And we would charge those batteries up. So we'd charge our cell phone, wait a few more days, charge it up again. And when that battery was getting a bit low, we'd then plug that into our solar panel and the solar panel would recharge the battery pack. And then the battery pack would charge our phone. Um, you can, of course, charge, plug stuff straight into the solar panel as well and charge it that way. And um, so we just had a whole bunch of, again, redundancy is important, a whole bunch of USB charging cables um, for various different things. So we had, um, my husband and I, we had a, a phone each. Um, we have, uh, what else do we have? I have a, a watch that needs recharged. We had the two battery packs. We each had our Kindles for the unlikely event that we had some downtime that we're actually awake for and we wanted to read our books. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the the um, the the photovoltaic charger we found to be very effective. Um, as long as we're organised about actually remembering, hey, the sun is out, we'll get this thing out and get everything charged up whenever we could, because we never knew when the next sunny day would be. So always have to be proactive. 
Um, and I think there was another question, yeah, about satellite phones. So we have an inReach device. It's an inReach mini. So it's actually this tiny little um, electronic box, which also actually we charged off the um, battery pack. Um, and that actually it effectively turns your cell phone into a satellite phone. So you can use it to um, send text messages, send and receive text messages via the inReach device. Um, the inReach device itself, you can also kind of type little me messages into it so if you don't want to pair it with your phone. Um, you can also use it um, to send like a track log. So we have a new one now and it actually sends a, a location, sends our location every 20 minutes or so. Um, so like our family all over the world, we have family in Scotland and family in New Zealand, they can actually track where we actually are from their computers or their phones in New Zealand if they want to. Um, that doesn't take as much power as you might think it might, um, but again, it was obviously comforting to have the, the battery backpack to recharge it. Um, and the, obviously the most important thing about that inReach device is that there's quite simply a giant SOS button. So even without any communication, you can hit SOS. Um, and then in theory, um, a bunch of people come and rescue you, um, which I understand is, is in fact very effective. So hopefully that answers those questions. That's great. That's really interesting. Um, there, people are more interested uh, still in kind of the the nuts and bolts of backcountry camping and me <laughs> cool. asking what type of tent did you use? <laughs> oh, that is a, also a very good question. So we, um, it was an interesting question because we actually spoke to somebody who had done this particular atlasing trip twenty years ago. Um, and she got us actually really scared about how much space we would actually be able to find to put our tent up. Um, she was very much, oh, it's very thick vegetation, or it's very wet, or it's the river. I guess the river is also very wet. Um, so there's not going to be space for your bug tent. You can't have a big tent. So we actually brought our, we have a little um, two-person mountaineering tent. It's actually a, a New Zealand um, brand. It's a minaret, a MacPac minaret tent. Um, and that was great. The problem with it was we'd kind of gotten used to having our kind of bigger three or four person tent, even with backcountry camping, where you can have lots of space and all of your gear inside it. Um, so that was kind of annoying. Um, but we realized that we actually did have a lot more space. I think the water levels were, were maybe a little bit different or maybe the vegetation had even had changed slightly. But we actually did manage to find some quite spacious areas to put our tents up, like you would have seen in those last few photos where we got hit by the, the thunderstorm. And um, we had space for our little tent, our colleagues, um, Don and George, they each had a tent of their own and we had the big bug tarp. So we managed to find plenty of space to get everything up. Um, the problem with our tent was that um, because we had to get up so early and because I really like sleeping, um, I would have to sleep in the afternoon in order to be slightly functional later. So we kind of do our point counts, come back, eat a ridiculously large pile of food and then sleep for a few hours. Um, and often that was in the hottest part of the day and some of our campsites were quite exposed to the sun so in that particular tent of ours doesn't have a whole lot of ventilation so we actually have a shiny new tent um, this year which we're excited to try out which is a lot more meshy on the inside so we're hoping that it has a lot more ventilation so that I can get my beauty sleep in the afternoon slightly more comfortably. <laughs> Very nice <laughs> thank you. And Michelle is asking whether you predetermine the bird observation locations or does the bird atlas do that? Um, yeah, the bird atlas does that. And I'm not sure exactly what went into that, but they were actually established probably um, the first time the first atlas ran. So not 20 years ago, but longer ago. Um, that was when a lot of stuff was kind of being worked out between the first and second atlas. Um, so the locations we had to go to were the locations that had been used in the previous atlas. And the idea behind that, of course, is, is so that we can genuinely document change over time from exactly the same sampling point. Like, what did I hear this year compared with what somebody else heard 20 years ago? Um, I think the risk is that if volunteers like us got to determine where the point counts were, they would all be along the river bank where it's really convenient to get to, which wouldn't necessarily be a good way to sample the landscape. So um, it, was, it was good to have to blindly go to those locations because some of them we, we might not have gotten to if we didn't feel that we had to go there. <laughs> Great. And Leslie's wondering, what is the difference between a Zoom recorder and the song meter? Mm, yeah, good question. Sorry, maybe I didn't go into that in quite enough detail. So the, 
The Zoom device, um, one key difference is that the Zoom device is not very weatherproof. Um, so you can't leave it out overnight, for example, it will get wet and be very unhappy. Um, whereas the song meters are actually really robust. They're in this nice little um, plastic, quite a, a hard plastic case and they're, they're watertight. So you can, you can actually leave them out and they are actually starting to do this. You can actually leave them out for a whole year. Um, and the other thing that's different about them is that the Zoom device isn't, um, is not, um, is not clever enough to know when to start and stop. So you just press play or record, and then you tell it, hey, I'm starting my point count now. And then it does its five minutes. And then you have to tell it, hey, I've stopped my point count now, and then stagger over to it and press stop. Um, whereas the ARUs are all pre-programmed. They know when to switch on for five minutes and when to switch off. And they know what time sunset and sunrise is relative to their location. So they're, they're much cleverer, much more weatherproof is really the difference. Great. And Patrick made the comment that your photos were beautiful. And could you share what camera lenses you took on the trip? Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Um, I, I do my best and it's not always easy to, to do much photography when you're, you're doing that. So I have a Canon with a, a zoom lens. Um, so it's a, um, what is it? It's a two to 400 mil zoom lens. Um, and I actually have, I forgot to put the slide in for this one, but I have a whole system for dealing with that on a canoe trip. I have a, um, I have it on a strap around my neck when I'm taking photos from in the canoe. Um, and then when I'm not taking photos and Brent makes me paddle, then I have it in a dry bag, in a camera bag, in another dry bag, um, between my feet and the canoe in front of me. Um, so I'm quite paranoid about keeping it dry and not accidentally installing it in the bottom of the river or the lake. So um, yeah, so I have a kind of soft neck tote bag, dry bag thing that I put it in um, while paddling, which I find fairly convenient. So, That's great. Yeah. And thanks for the kind words. Sierra is asking, where can we learn more or sign up for volunteering? I think everyone wants to come along now. The pictures you showed of the mosquitoes were not <laughs> putting enough. Yeah, clearly not. That's great. I'm, I'm glad I didn't put anyone off. Um, so if you Google Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, that's probably your best um, starting point. You'll find the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas website. Um, there's a ton of information on that website there, and there's also an opportunity there where you can you can actually sign up as an official volunteer. And once you do that, that will give you access into a little bit of a deeper kind of portal into that website where you can see some of the data that's already been collected um, and work out um, where there are gaps in data collection. Because now we're, we're, we're a couple of years into data collection. So now the Atlas is really keen to send people to the places where we maybe haven't got as much information or at times of year where we're, where we're maybe lacking stuff a little bit. Now, every data point is really important, but there's some areas that are perhaps really more in need of help than others. So, so yeah, go to go go find the website and, and see what, what you can do from there. That's a good segue because Linda is asking and, and more interested in the long-term patterns in the data. And over the years, has the number of breeding birds changed and what kind and where? Right, well, great question. So I'm not really the right expert to, to really answer that as, as fully as someone from say Birds Canada might be able to. Um, there is some information again on the Atlas website um, and obviously they're still processing data that's been collected during this effort. We won't know for sure for another kind of three or four years after this data collection effort. Um, one thing anecdotally that I felt really sad about, and I, I think might be a real change, is that the lady that we talked to that had done the same atlasing trip as us 20 years ago, um, she was, oh yeah, it's really beautiful. When you're paddling along the shrubs along the side of the river, they're just absolutely full of rusty blackbirds. You'll see rusty blackbirds all the time. They're all over the place. Um, I saw one individual on the entire trip. Um, now that might just be a slightly, I mean, it's more or less the same time of year, but that might just be a very slight difference in weather patterns this year compared with her trip 20 years ago, or maybe a slightly different change in the dates that she was out versus I was out. So I'm trying not to be too scared by that observation, but um, that is a species that is declining. And there is concern about, about what's happening on both their breeding migration and wintering grounds. Um, so there's definitely some significant changes of that nature that we're detecting. Um, one of the key things that they did find between the first atlas and the second atlas was that was when we started to learn about certain groups of birds that are declining really precipitously. 
Um, and one of those groups is what's called the aerial insectivores. So that's birds that, that hunt insects on the wings. So barn swallows, um, night hawks, whippoorwills, those, those, that kind of group of species um, had declined really significantly between the, the first and the second atlas. Um, similarly, some of our grassland birds, so things like bobolinks and, and eastern meadowlarks have, and Henslow sparrows as well, in fact, have almost completely disappeared from, from the province. So that's the, the real importance of these atlasing efforts is that um, we're actually able to put data behind some of these things. We, we might all be noticing a little bit, yeah, I'm not really hearing as many wood thrush anymore. I don't see barn swallows quite as much. Um, these, these incredible sort of Herculean volunteer data collection efforts are really what allows us to, to, to detect those changes. Um, there's a few changes that are, are in a well, at least in terms of a, a positive change. So one example that they actually showed recently looking at some preliminary data is that common ravens have really increased in southern Ontario. So for example, even where I am here in Middlesex County, I've lived here for not quite 20 years, but um, since 2006, however many years that is. And I'd never ever seen a raven in Middlesex County until two years ago. And now I see them almost every time I go out to certain parts of the county. So, and that is a real change, I gather, that in especially these far southwestern Ontario counties, ravens have become a lot more abundant and seem to be recolonizing areas from where they had been lost for quite a large number of years. So not everything is in precipitous decline, but I'm often suspicious even about some of the increases as to whether that's always entirely a good thing or, or trying to understand what is actually driving that, because it's, it's not always straightforward that, oh, yay, more of this is a good thing. It's not always quite that simple. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a long-winded way of saying that it's complicated and some things are doing really badly. Yeah, thank you, Barry. There's one last question, and it looked very remote uh, after the plane took off. So was it complete <laughs> wilderness that you, you lived through, or did you see any signs of human habitation anywhere you traveled? Yeah, well, interesting question. So Yes and no. So there were large tracts where we saw absolutely nothing. Like we had no, there was no evidence of anyone having camped previously on any of the sites that we camped at. We didn't find any, you know, fire rings or cut wood or anything like that at all. It, was, it seemed very much like we were the first people to ever camp there, which I'm sure we're not, of course, but um, we didn't, there were no footpaths that had clearly been made by humans. Any little tracks we followed were, um, were probably mammal tracks. Um, we did find, I did mention that we were really at the eastern edge of the Ring of Fire um, and actually quite, so on our flight in we flew over an absolutely colossal um, mining exploration camp which was pretty interesting to see. Um, so it was a bit of the, the muskeg that had been kind of flattened out and presumably drained to degree with a whole bunch of buildings and bulldozers and things on it. So that was actually not that far upstream from where we ended up landing. Um, so that was certainly interesting to see. Um, one of my point counts quite early on, I actually had to stop it because a helicopter flew over, which was not what I was expecting um, that far north. It was really actually quite disappointing to hear a helicopter, but that was only once. Um, and there were there was actually one point, our second camp was actually in an area, um, a beautiful area above the river, and there was actually an old trapper's cabin there. Um, the cabin was kind of dilapidated and it was locked up, so obviously we, we didn't go in, but um, that had obviously been used fairly recently. There was a fair amount of garbage at that site as well, so it had clearly been accessed potentially by a snowmobile in the winter, maybe, I'm not quite sure. Um, and then further down the river at the, um, the confluence of the Atawapiskat, there were several um, protest signs that the several local Indigenous nations had put up protesting against the Ring of Fire. Um, so again, that was pretty poignant to see to see those signs of of, of human human use of that landscape, obviously, um, but also to see the message that that they were sending to anyone that happened to pass by. Um, it's a real mixture, like a real juxtaposition of feeling super super remote, super wildernessy, but also being aware that there are people using this landscape today, um, and also seeing signs that that way of life is is perhaps being threatened by some of the changes that we might be seeing. True. So other than all the birds, were there any other significant or outstanding wildlife encounters that you had this year? Um, it probably wasn't as exciting wildlife-wise as the, the Wabakimi trip 
that I talked about this time last year with you. Um, we only saw a couple of moose, and we did see that a very brief glimpse of a of a little little family of wolves. Um, I'm trying to think if we saw any other actual mammals. I don't know if we did see any other mammals. We didn't see any bears. Hmm. We did find a big per pile of, of bear droppings actually at one of our sites, <laughs> one of our campsites. Um, we found some caribou droppings, which is cool, but no no caribou were attached anymore. A um, few wolf prints in the in the the silt along the the edge of the river, but only that one glimpse of of the wolves. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think anything else. It's more the the kind of the will the sense of wilderness and the the big open vistas that were that were particularly impressive for me this year. Yeah, it's great. So were you able this time? I remember also from your last presentation, there there were some significant adventurous portaging in, involved <laughs> in portages that no one had walked on in a long, long time. Were you able to mostly stick to the river this time or were the areas they were not that were not canoeable? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually did not do a single portage on this entire trip. Um, we covered, I think it was about 125 kilometers and it was all on river. The water levels were, were it was relatively early season. So it was kind of mid June or thereabouts. So the water levels, um, I think were unusually high this spring or last spring, but they also, we were early enough in the season that the water levels were going to be fairly high anyway. Um, and the river, the Mukatai River itself, it's, from a canoeing perspective, it's arguably not a super exciting river to paddle. Um, there were only a few little kind of riffly rapids that we we did get out and scout one of them just to make sure we knew what we were letting ourselves in for, but nothing that required anything, any complicated steering and certainly nothing that we would think about portaging around, um, which is probably just as well because I don't know what, <laughs> what the portaging would have been like. It might have been quite awkward um, because I don't know how much that particular river is used. Um, the Atawapiskat River itself is a much bigger river and is incredibly fast flowing. Um, and actually our last set of point counts, we actually had to paddle across it and slightly upstream to get to, to those point counts. And that was brutally hard work, um, not because it was white water, just because it was a lot of water flowing very, very fast in the opposite direction to where we wanted to go. Um, which of course was fantastic when we turned around to leave to get down to our pickup point. We barely had to paddle. We could just sit in the river and kind of be, you know, brought along. I'm not sure how fast we were going, kind of 10 or 15 kilometers an hour without even paddling, I think. Quite impressive. Yeah, that sounds intense. Yeah. Well, I have um, one last question, just so that I understand it right. Did you mention in the beginning when you flew in that the canoe was strapped to the float plane, like on the outside? Yeah, exactly. So it was kind of terrifying to strap your um, quite expensive toy. Yeah, to that's what I thought. <laughs> kind of little plane, but um, we, um, we're always very respectful of the experience that the pilot has doing that. And we're very happy to let the pilot do that part. Um, and we um we certainly we trust him implicitly. And it was it was very thoroughly strapped on and but it, it's above the float so that when you land in the water, then the canoe is still above the water and not going to get damaged by that landing. Yeah, I was wondering um, about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean it's a float plane, so it, it can't land anywhere except on washer when it has those floats attached. So um, from that perspective, your your canoe is, is going to be safe. Um, I think it was actually last year in Wabakimi, we kind of joked with the pilot about, oh yeah, how many canoes have you lost doing this? Ha ha ha. And he was like, oh, only one. Um, so we, we, we didn't inquire further as to what the story might be about that, but um, I'm sure it happens from time to time. But the, these British pilots are incredibly experienced. We have huge amounts of respect for them. Um, and tying boats onto float planes is a, a thing they do very, very frequently. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. How exciting is this? This is so interesting and unique. Um, thank you again, Barry McFarlane, for your fascinating presentation of your big journey through the Northern Ontario wilderness again. Um, the presentation clearly also shows the importance of research conducted uh, up there and here in our natural areas. And without Vari's work, we would not know uh, as much about the health of our natural areas, and we would be much less able to protect them. So thank you for, for going on these adventures and sharing not just the data, but also your experiences with us so that we can have our, our armchair enjoyment here um, on a kind of early March uh, evening here in Southwestern Ontario. 
So as you all know here at RARE, we are also committed to protecting the natural areas of Waterloo Region and Wellington County, but we're not able to do that without the support of, of everybody here watching this. So again, if you enjoyed this, this, please help us to continue our work and help us to continue to, um, to provide these education events free to the community as well by considering making a donation at rarecites.org um, slash donate or enter the 50-50 raffle. I just got known, I think it has cracked the $3,000 uh, mark now, the total pot, so that's really exciting. As I mentioned previously, the draw will take place this Friday at 3 p.m. And I think it's three tickets for $10, 10 tickets for $20, or 50 tickets for $50. So this is your chance to give to nature and perhaps you get something more back than you even usually do. So go snatch up those tickets as long as you can. And um, stay tuned for uh, more announcements that James will be sending around about our next conversations for conservation. Um, we have planned one for March 29th already that we will hope to announce the speaker shortly. And on Wednesday, April 26th at 7 p.m., we would like to welcome everyone in person at the Rare Eco Center in Slit Barn to hear Dr. Victoria McPhail to talk about how to grow a pollinator garden. So if you've been thinking for a while of making a garden friendly to native pollinators, you don't want to miss this free event either. And be sure to sign up if you haven't done so already for our biweekly rare e-news to learn more about these events as they become available. And thank you again, Vari. This was so great. Uh, great to see you. And thanks again, everyone, for coming out here online this evening. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon on our trails, which are scheduled to fully open again March 15th, and uh, also at our live events coming this spring. Have a good night, and thank you, everybody.